Ever think about where your recyclables go after the blue bin? Well, for a long time, about a fifth of American mixed recyclables were heading across the sea to China. That makes sense since China has the largest manufacturing output in the world, and they need the scrap material to create all your favorite paper and plastic items. However, following a public awareness campaign and outcry from Chinese citizens, ignited in some cases by the documentary Plastic China, the country implemented a series of policies called Green Fence, National Sword, and Blue Sky to stop your curbside pickup from ending up in unmanageable quantities in China. The world's largest paper consumer radically changed their specification. They've basically set a standard that's, if not impossible, sort of effectively impossible to achieve. Rest assured, goods are still being recycled. It became a buyer's market. But communities and industry organizations now have to pay processing plants to take the goods instead of selling the scrap material for a profit. In 2017, mixed paper, which is everything but cardboard, was trading at roughly $90 a ton. Currently, it's trading at roughly nothing. These changes have created a bright spot in the industry for new development in areas where China has left a plastic water bottle shaped hole. In fact, some Chinese corporations are investing in recycling facilities in Maine and West Virginia. National Sword has been a major benefit to our business model and we think long term will be a tremendous benefit to recycling, infrastructure, and circular economy development in North America. Changes in Chinese policies has really focused attention and energy, uh, and I'm also glad to say innovation, on uh, the topic of, of recycling. In total, resource recycling found the impact of China's new recycling policies created over $4.4 billion of investment in the U.S., which is supporting over 3,000 American jobs. Since China stopped purchasing American scrap materials, why are Chinese companies investing in recycling in the U.S.? To understand why China stopped processing a large portion of global recyclables, we need to review why they started collecting it. Many American communities had adopted single-stream recycling for its ease of use and collection. That is when residents place plastics, metal, and glass into one, typically blue, bin. When your materials are collected at the curb, they are then taken to a facility and they're sorted out automatically. We were essentially offshoring our labor of sorting these materials to China. While this method encourages more participation in recycling, it also increases the amount of contamination in what is recycled. Contamination occurs when non-recyclable items are collected alongside recycled items, when they've been placed in the wrong bin, or when soiled products, say a dirty food container, is placed in the recycling bin. Effectively what the Chinese were saying was that the U.S. recycling industry was sending it recyclables that were also stuffed with a lot of garbage. And a lot of that developed because the Chinese for so long had such an insatiable appetite for our recyclable commodities. They would take a higher level of contamination. Now keep in mind that is a dealer by dealer, not a a MRF to country, you know, this is a policy, this is just how the market behaved. The materials that we were sending over to China, their liable contamination levels were around the 3 to 5 percent range historically. That was the industry standard. A 2018 study showed that China had imported a cumulative 45 percent of plastic waste since 1992. And in 2016, 72 percent of all U.S. plastic scrap exports went to China. At one time during the peak, we exported about 30% of our material, the, the recycled paper material, into China. Uh, that's down to less than 3%. About half of the paper that we received from the city was going to China. All that was made much easier by the trade deficit with China, which has topped over $300 billion every year since 2012. We import a great deal of manufactured goods from China and they come on ships with big containers. Those containers were going back empty before the rise of recycling. In fact, Public Radio International estimated that the U.S. was sending nearly 4,000 shipping containers of recyclable goods to China every day. For us, there's always more value in that material to be able to recycle it as opposed to putting it in the landfill. Organizations like Waste Management, 
worked with brokers to send their recyclables overseas, where they would get a better price for the goods. It was a uh, an aphorism in the recycling industry is that China had the most stringent environmental laws in place. They just didn't enforce them. Well, that changed beginning in 2013 with a customs enforcement action called Operation Green Fence. Laws regarding specific environmental regulations were passed in 2006 and 2010, and the country began an official crackdown in February 2013. Companies were importing dirty bales from the United States using the recyclables and then just discarding the garbage in a river, the ocean, a street corner. In 2017, China announced a set of even stricter restrictions on specific recovered materials called National Sword, including recovered mixed paper, many types of plastics and textiles. One of the things that drove National Sword was the increasing expectation of uh, Chinese citizens to have a better standard of living. China set the maximum contamination level for loads of recyclables, not fully banned, to 0.5%. They've basically set a standard that's, if not impossible, sort of effectively impossible to, to achieve, a sort of a half a percent contamination rate. And so from going from 4 or 5% non-acceptable material to a half a percent overnight, caused the turmoil in the recycling markets. The Chinese decided that they wanted to stay highly focused on recycled commodities, but didn't want any of America's uh, garbage. And so they put that policy in place, which I think caused some short-term pain in the American recycling industry. Recovered plastic shipments to China dropped about 99% from 2017 to 2018. However, recyclable scrap materials are still being collected, so the industry is starting to adapt. You get a lot more environmental, economic, and job benefits out of recycling than you do out of just throwing something in a hole in the ground. It's because of you know this recognition that was in large part prompted by China Sword that the, the enthusiasm for really taking a good hard look at the America recycling system has started. We've had to find alternative markets. So while Waste Management is a North American company, we actually have offices in China, in Southeast Asia, and South America. And so we had relationships with paper mills that we have uh, called on to say, hey, can you take some of the material now that China is not accepting it anymore? For a short while, other countries in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, India, and Indonesia, accepted some of the recycling bales that China refused. However, many of those ports are ill-equipped to handle such a mass import of scrap materials and have begun following China's example in setting stricter standards and bans. The materials finding homes is just that the value has plummeted. So you, you even saw Malaysia send materials back, mixed plastics back to the countries of origin, uh, UK, France, and the US, as well as Canada. Um, but also the the long lasting impacts of national sword and blue you know blue sky and green fence and china scrap ban is that those countries feel that they can push back on what the materials are that are coming back into their system long term it's going to be of a major benefit because it's going to force the industry to be much much more efficient produce a much higher quality product that will actually be able to be used in domestic manufacturing supply chains. Well, the real focus of uh, EPA's work is focusing on the U.S. system and, and building a system that is more resilient to both changes in international markets, but also, and critically, changes in the stream of, of uh, materials that are you know, available for recycling. New American sorting facilities are opening up to process the scrap material and American companies are investing in updating their materials recovery facilities, or MRFs, to meet the new standards. In fact, in total, we're, we've seen more than $4.4 billion of investment of opening new, new facilities, reopening facilities, or retooling existing facilities to be able to take in that material from the, the mixed paper or uh, the cardboard streams. Uh, and that is supporting over 3,000 jobs uh, here in the U.S. 
we can still get to that uh, that that very strict quality that our, our customers demand of us at this point. Uh, and so we've done a lot of investments in uh, in, in new recycling facilities, uh, in robotics, uh, in new optical sorting technology. And so we, we've really gone after the technology side to help solve the problem as well as education. We started sorting to domestic specifications about six, seven years ago before the most recent Chinese restrictions came on. Nine Dragons seems to be very aggressive in investing in American recycling infrastructure. Uh, they're developing a number of paper recycling and pulping uh, projects in the United States in order to bring that uh, recycled pulp uh, back into China. Paper giant ND, owned by Nine Dragons Paper, recently opened mills in Maine, Wisconsin, and West Virginia. While their operations combine virgin and recycled goods, according to ND, their Fairmont, West Virginia mill has the capacity for 240,000 tons of recycled pulp. Industry is stepping up and investing here, both overseas industry like China, but also existing paper and plastics recyclers here in the United States. Phoenix Paper Company, a subsidiary of Chinese company Shanging International, recently opened a paper mill in Kentucky. They announced that in 2021, the company plans to expand the Kentucky mill to include a recycling facility. They've invested $200 million in the project that will create an additional 150 jobs in the area. One of the, the reasons behind China's support in the recycling system is they have fewer forests as a natural resource to be able to, to, to make paper and pulp out of. So they're coming to the U.S since they still have a tremendous appetite for recycled paper. And it's the pulp that is now being exported to China, which is a way for the Chinese to get access to this recycled paper that they value without the contamination that they were so concerned about. Time will tell if these new facilities are successful, but they are creating jobs here in the U.S. Paper mill jobs are good, hard jobs that have buoyed communities around the United States since its inception. In 2019, there was over $3 billion invested in recycling and circular economy infrastructure in the United States, which is and will continue to drive major job growth. Ultimately, the good environmental benefits of recycling don't happen when you and I put it in that cart or they're picked up by a truck or even when they're sorted out. It's when it replaces new material in the circular economy that you get the benefits and it has to be clean for it to, to be that, uh, displace that new material. Collaboration between the people at each end of a product's life will help reduce the burden on individual consumers and create a more circular economy. We need to both be able to design things so they can properly go through the recycling system. It's communicated to consumers like you and I on how to recycle properly but also that there's enough demand for the materials to, as we say it in the industry, to pull it through the system because somebody needs to buy that stuff for it to become that circular loop. For too long, there's been a major disconnect between product designers, brands, recycling facilities, and then who manufactures products. They've unfortunately been operating in their own silos. A lot of what we do as a uh, leader in developing the circular economy is connecting all of those organizations that are actually hyper dependent on each other. One thing that EPA did was to hold the first ever National Recycling Summit uh, back in November of uh, 2018 and then that progressed to the Recycling Summit uh, that we had uh, held here in Washington DC where we uh, then uh, issued the National Recycling Framework. And so a lot of activity now is ongoing to look across the recycling system to improve it. And, and really ultimately, recycling is about a market and what a market can bear. And uh, the market basically is changing. It's forcing everybody to focus on efficiency, product design, reuse of material. The innovation that I, I, I'm confident that the American recycling system will produce will, uh, will have some really excellent results.